somebody just looking for the, the meeting ID um, at least if you get a chance. Okay, so um, hello everyone. Um, you're very welcome to our webinar tonight. Uh, our speaker and guest is Simon Wall. So Simon has been the town architect for Westport for over two decades. And uh, during that time, he's helped oversee its re regeneration. Uh, it's become a multi-award winner at Tidy Towns. And it was also named by Irish Times as the best place to live in Ireland. So Simon has shared his insights at events like McGill Summer School and to other towns looking to glean some of the approaches that have allowed Westport to flourish. So we're very lucky that Simon has been to Port a few times as his good friend Paul uh, is from here and is on the line tonight. So, hey Paul, how's it going? Um, the talk comes at a key time for Port with the recent appointment of a Downey Planning and Architecture Consultants to work on a regeneration plan and with the leasing of the square market building at the heart of the town by the council. So just to note, a key remit of the consultants is that there's engagement with local groups and they are due to produce the report by the 31st of January. So it's quite a short time window. Um, we have fantastic ingredients in Port with their unique heritage, location, demographics, and the diversity of clubs and social groups that bring the town to life. So it'd be great if people get inspired, uh, think positively about how we can make our living environment better and even reach out to some of our groups. So the meeting will be recorded and made available and there'll be a Q&A at the end. So if you want to use the Q&A uh, option in Zoom there to post in any questions and we'll get, them, get to them at the end, we'll put them to Simon at the end. So that's it. So I hope you have your, your glass of wine, bottle of beer or a cup of tea or all three ready to go and I'll hand to speak to you here tonight. Uh, I must say this is the first time I've spoken through uh, the internet. It's always been a town hall event and we've given this talk the length and breadth of the nation over the years and um, so this is the first time through the internet. So it's a little experimental for myself tonight uh, but I hope it'll convey the message as well as it does within the town hall uh, system pre-COVID. So what I'm going to do now Mark, I'm just going to turn off the lights here so I can focus on the presentation in full yeah. cinematic experience. And I'll be back in just 30 seconds. No problems. Probably should have lined up some elevator music for, uh, for this juncture, but anyway. <laughs> okay, now Mark, the, uh, the viewers can see my screen now, they can. Yeah, that looks fine as far as I can see. The, the, the presentation is loaded there. Yeah, so hopefully everyone can see that. Um, as Marcus said earlier on, my name is Simon Wall. I'm a government architect. I work for Mayo County Council and I've been there for about 23 years and my job for the vast majority of that time over two decades has been uh, input into the regeneration of Westport, the urban regeneration of the town in the context of the built environment. And um, I've been asked here this evening to speak through the wonders of the internet. It really because something significant is happening in Port Arlington at the moment. Leash counts are tremendously visionary and securing a lease of building in Port Arlington, the campus garage, or Ryan's. And as part of the acquisition of this lease, they're putting together an urban regeneration structure where links out into the rural countryside and connects with other towns um, along your local blueways and greenways. So it, it, it's a super thing to, to, for a, a local authority to, to commission. It's very visionary. And it reminds me very much uh, when back in the millennium when we commissioned a very similar urban regeneration strategy for Westport. And we call that Westport 2000. And yours is called Port Arlington 230. So really, I'm going to share the story of Westport over the last 20 years. And the parallels will be very similar between yourselves and ourselves in terms of the strategy and, and, and your approach to it. And uh, so really, I, I'm revealing, I suppose, things that are going to happen to you in the future on foot of this urban new generation strategy. So it's really important that the intellectual capital you put into this and the effort you make at this stage in terms of planning will pay dividends on the road, and that's very important. But firstly, I thought I'd just start a little bit about Irish towns generally. And I'm a big fan of the Georgians because really they were the great Irish urbanists. They were the ones who really heralded the transition from Ireland being a rural society into an urban society. And they built a network of towns the length and breadth of this nation. And they built them when, when the Georgians were given lands in Ireland and they settled. And um, they built a whole network of towns. And the towns were built a day apart from each other. 
So in other words, you were never more than half a day's walk from a town. So most towns in Ireland are between 10 and 15 miles away from each other. So you walk to your town, you got your produce and you came back and you didn't have to stay overnight. And you can see the patterns of towns in Mayo with the blue dots up on the right hand side and Leash will be exactly the same in terms of their distances. And um, so it was the most expansive urbanization period, the Georgian period in Ireland. It was the greatest uh, period of building, uh, only matched by the Celtic Tiger in recent times. So it was and in those towns, they built great squares uh, that became the living rooms of the towns and you can see Port Arlington Main Street on the left hand side just across from what was then known as Burns Garage and it's bustling full of life and I go on to the next slide this also gave a, a great economic uh, this urbanization of towns within Ireland gave a great economic stability to the country so all these towns are the strong societal economic and architectural framework and this um, every trades, you inherited your father's trade, your father's profession, and the merchant prince's sons inherited that, and the political dynasties were affiliated to various families, and families had affiliations with certain educational establishment. That inherited um, framework went from generation to generation, giving great stability to Irish towns for about 150 years, and it really only changed halfway through the last century. But leading up to that for that 150 years, every family lived above their shop, Every street had its own football team or bonfire on bonfire night. And the town's main square was bustling with life. And essentially, if a town was a house, its main square is its living room. So I know with yourselves, with the urban regeneration strategy for the main square, you're looking at really, really doing up your living room again. And also, those public spaces were great theatrical spaces. And despite them being provided by the Anglo-Irish, they heralded in the new nation uh, for months, big, big meetings with Daniel O'Connell, and you can see Michael Collins on the left-hand side. So they hosted, really, the intellectual birth of, of our nation. But um, I suppose when it came to the 20th century, this 150 years of stability started coming to an end. And the demise of the rural Irish town, not so much on the East Coast or the Midlands where you are, but particularly in the West Coast where I am, um, is complex. But one of the biggest things was the advent of the motor car. Suddenly people had choice. You, did, you weren't affiliated to your local town. You could travel to another town that might have been slightly better or to better shopping. And people started uh, popularizing specific towns and not others. So some went on the wane. And another thing that really affected the demise of the rural Irish town is refrigeration. Because instead of having to get fresh produce locally by walking into town each day, you could buy food and store it for five or six weeks. So it didn't necessitated you not going into town. And there are two things that triggered the demise of the, of the rural Irish town, which is much more prevalent where I am in the West. And there's a famous book about it by a guy called John Healy, called No One, Started, no One Shouted Stuff on the left-hand side there. But I'm going to tell you, really, this is the story of Westport over the last 20 years. And uh, really, a small rural Irish town in decline fighting back. So we start, you know, Westport, wh what are we as a town? We're a small town on a small island, despite what we might think, off a slightly ar larger island, despite what they might think, off an ever-expanding Europe, with the exception of Brexit, of course. And really, just to survive as a viable town in rural Ireland uh, really is quite a challenge. To thrive, it requires strong local leadership, like you're displaying to Sievling and Port Arlington, an immense amount of cooperation and coordinated teamwork. It's about the local authority, the volunteer groups, the chambers, the hotels, and the businesses coming together. And uh, it's, it's, it really is a tough thing to do, but there's been many successful examples around the country. And as Bono would say in his song, you know, sometimes you're just running to stand still, trying to make progress with the town. Um, like Port Arlington, Westport is a planned town, and Westport dates back about 250 years, founded by the Altamont family. The big house is Westport House, the equivalent to your emo house. And for us, it's really important because Westport brings in 60% uh, of the tourists coming into Mayo visit Westport House as their primary reason each year, and their spend is over 50 million. So don't underestimate the power of Emo House and the spin off it has for Port Arlington for yourselves. Um, there's Crowpatrick in the background, the town in the foreground, there's Westport House there, and the town around it, and the house itself, and you can see the Altamans there. And uh, they opened up Westport House in the 1960s to tourism with caravan and camping. 
and they were pioneers in Irish tourism. Today, Westport economy has two, has two drivers, the two T's we call it, technology and tourism. We're very fortunate that we built an IDA park back in the 70s and a small American multinational came called Allergan and they have grown from strength to strength and they have a thousand employees. And believe it or not, they manufacture the entire planet's supply of Botox. So if you're Tom Cruise in California or you're someone on the West End or the East Enders in London, your Botox is 100% guaranteed Irish. And I'll be posting up some samples to Mark to give out as spot prizes at next week's meeting for those who turn up. And on the left-hand side, tourism is very important for us as well. We've really pushed that over the last 15 to 20 years by building a lot of hotels. Because when you build hotels, you create bed nights. And once people stay, the spin off and the spend locally is very important. Um, the type of things we offer, you know, it rains a lot in Ireland. We don't offer sun holidays like Spain. So it's cultural experience. It's book clubs, it's military reenactments, it's music in pubs, you know, it's, it's socializing really. Um, if you look at the town from an aerial perspective, it's actually two towns. You have Westport House in the center, the historic core. You have the historic town, three miles inland. And then you have a secondary urban center at the Keela Harbor. And that's expanding, particularly over the Celtic Tiger in a horseshoe shape around the domain of Westport House in the center. And me as a government architect and a planner, it is my job to structure uh, that in context of the planning over, to, over those 20 years. So it's been quite a journey over two decades, but again, most of it triggered from the urban regeneration strategy that we put together, which you are currently working on with Leash County Council. If you look at the town core of Westport, this is the main civic space, the octagon, the clock is the other one. And uh, the Georgians were great at town planning. And one of the things they did was, if you look at the slide at the bottom left-hand side where I'm annotating, that's the river running through Westport. It's narrow and meandering and organic and it runs out of Westport in the top left-hand side of the slide. But what the Georgians did, they, they, they took away that section of the river be, be, between um, the top and the bottom of the slide. They created two artificial lakes and let the water flow in the top of one and out the bottom of the other. And they created a boulevard uh, with trees on both sides and the merchant prince's house is standing proud in nice, neat, tidy rows, not unlike they are in Port Arlington as well. So the whole town is an architectural statement and civic gesture as you travel through from one end to the other. The other area is Westport Harbour and uh, a lot of redevelopment was done there during the Celtic Tiger period. We had section 23 tax designation for building ho holiday accommodation. So it attracted about 250 million euros worth of development throughout the entire town. And what we did is we tried to put a lot of our holiday accommodation down at the harbor area here, you know, where people like to be beside the ocean and it could be managed as a coherent block. And it was reasonably successful. Um, Westport is, is, is well known for winning awards nationally, but it wasn't always that way. And um, this is one a piece of sculpture we built recently to celebrate winning the best place to live in Ireland with the Irish Times, which I'll talk a little bit about later on. But we have quite a reputation, but it wasn't always that way. Because if you look at that slide and we go to the next one, this is Westport in the 1980s. You know, it was a, it was a drab place. You know, we were underperforming. Um, this is the main civic space, the Octagon. It's jammed with cars and trailers. You know, the uh, blocking up of buildings with people emigrating, boarded up windows overhead overhead wires and um, essentially the social space which we talked about earlier on in terms of Georgian towns where it was the, the theatre of the town becomes one big sea of tarmac and very unappealing and this was Westport not in your great-grandfather's time and you know it, this is within living memory and this is how much we've changed in such a short time so it's very feasible and very possible. Um, so what we did coming up to the millennium we were wondering you know where are we going to continue and demise as a town or where are we going to fight back? So instead of celebrating the millennium by building a piece of sculpture and carving the town's name in it, we decided to commission an intellectual gift for the town, that we'd commission an urban regeneration strategy, just as you're doing in Port Arlington at the moment. And what we did is we looked at the town in a series of axonometric drawings like this, and we felt, gosh, you know, all the existing uh, buildings in the town were in white, and all the brownfield sites in the backland we felt they could be redeveloped. So we ignored land ownership when we started drawing sketches of where new streetscapes could be, where new parking could be. 
and also then where new pedestrianised public realm spaces could be in the historic town core, and looking at putting car parking in the backlands to allow us pedestrianise a little bit more in the civic spaces. And this study, Westport 2000, dealt with the very big things like I've discussed from car parking and streetscapes and public plazas and uh, private and uh, local authority developments, right down to small things like what sort of signage we should use, what color schemes we should use, what trees we should use in the streetscape. So it went from the very large to the very small. And uh, so uh, when we finished Westport 2000, we went through a consultation, that's just like you're going through at the moment. We had a lot of meetings and town halls, like, and with a lot of presentations, just like you're having now with Port Arlington. And uh, when we finished the plan, we were slightly frightened of it. It was quite a heap, a large document. We wondered where should we start? So we decided we'd start small. And the first thing we said we would tackle would be signage. And signage at the time in Westport was growing like an invasive species of plant out of all the hedgerows because the tourism industry coming into town. And everyone had different sizes of, of, of signs and different sorts of graphics and all, all it was a real mishmash. So what we did is we consulted with all the B&B &B people, the various tourism organizations, and we designed standardized signage uh, for the town center. And anyone who didn't require a sign, an advanced warning sign, we took them away. And essentially what happened is at junctions like this on the left-hand side of the Knock Granny, there was about 20 or 30 different hodgepodge of signs on it. We removed them and we licensed finger post signs instead. So nice, tidy appearance. Now this is very small thing, signage as individuals, but collectively, we removed probably about an acre and a half of signage from all the approach roads. So collectively, it started making a big difference. And then we started putting in orientation signs for the town center on the right-hand side for pedestrians going around. And the next thing we approached after signage, we said we would look at planting. And this is the way we used to plant. It's a Victorian style, single species, monoblock type of planting. And uh, we moved away from that after we won the Tidy Towns because we ended up going to France. When you win the National Tidy Towns, the central government sends you off to compete against the best in Europe. And we ended up going to Limoges in France. And we met uh, the French gardeners in that particular city. And we were out with them for one night. And I brought these pictures of our plants being very proud. And I took them out of my pocket. And I said, do you like our planting? And the French gardeners said, no, I don't. <laughs> I said, gosh, I, that, that, that's a pity. And the French guy said, his name was Pierre. He said, Simon, we will come to your lawn and we will plant for you. So I thought nothing about this. And I said, that's great. And sure enough, in March next year, we got a phone call to say they were coming. We had to pay for the bulbs and the diesel, but they but they bring their own van and they'd plant plants for us. So we said, come on over. They planted all the bulbs. We gave them Irish coffees. They went home. We never thought twice about it till June came. And all of a sudden, and the bulbs they planted started coming out and this is what happened there's the octagon had a real stand it's a real continental style planting which was never done in ireland before but there's things in that like decorative cabbage gone to seed and sugar beet that's gone to seed and wild daisies and really we planted all our main traffic islands with these plants and it cost us maybe three or four grand and we got really good bang for our book because people loved it and it was very prominent in the town centre. So we've been planting like that for the subsequent 12, 13 years since. Uh, so it's a French style planting. Uh, and it's been really successful for us. So sometimes you can get a lot of value out of spending a little amount of money. Like you can build a new road for 10 million and people can be indifferent. Whereas with planting, you know, for a little money, you get a lot of value and a lot of buy-in from the public and it develops a strong relationship with the local authority and the public through the councillors. Um, and that's the other, that's the, just, just another view of the planting on the octagon as well. So, you know, most towns in Ireland, a traffic line, a traffic island is reflective plastic boxes that are illuminated and reflective paint, but traffic islands can be beautiful in town centres as well and can make a positive contribution to the public ground space. The next thing we tried uh, was signage. As the town architect in, in the local authority, I, we offered that if anyone came in with a photograph of their building, showing the neighboring buildings, that I would design a color scheme for them. If they didn't like the color scheme, I designed a second one or a third one and uh, until they were happy. And then they painted that. And really, it was a way of getting people to talk about color and interact with us as a local authority a lot more and get a dialogue going. And the actual color wasn't really that important. It was the fact that people are painting their buildings every two to three years and keeping them sharp. But you get great value out of color 
because for 300 euro, for buy 300 euros worth of paint and you can color your front facade and people notice it. You get a lot of bang for your buck, but you spend 30 grand on a new fit out in your interior and people can be indifferent. So if you're starting urban regeneration, color schemes are a great way to kickstart it very quickly and get people involved. And you get a lot of visual um, visual buy-in and, 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 and a visual gain for very little money. And, you know, I was saying you can't really go wrong with colour. This was during the Celtic Tiger and a guy called Tom Braun came into me and he said, I have an idea for a colour scheme and it's lime green, bright yellow, orange and pink and purple. I said, my God, Tom, you know, we'll try it. And it was one of the nicest colour schemes. It's all about vibrancy and brightness and, 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 you know, painting your shop every two to three years to keeping it presented as part of the town consciousness. The next thing we started for our plan that we put together was every time a planning application came in, we conditioned in the architectural conservation areas, if it was a big job and finances the scheme could take it, we conditioned the removal of plastic, placed them with the original sliding sash. So this is an old PVC being taken out, this development and a new sliding sash window going in. And you know, just only on the front elevations above the shops, not to the rear or anywhere else. And collectively, over the Celtic Tiger period, we've probably replaced maybe about 100. Individually, it doesn't make it big, but collectively, it starts to do that. The next thing in terms of the planning process, we started to look at new infills in the town centre. This is brand new. We made sure the building massing matched the neighbouring one. It was an empty slot, natural slate roof, sliding sash windows, limestone sill. Try and projecting signage on buildings are projecting lighting on stalks so we try to get the lighting rebated under the cornice and we tend not to permit security shutters because they just become canvases for graffiti in the evening and sometimes people like banks or jewelers insist on it so in this instance we had the uh, security shutter which is perforated so you can see through it running behind the glass so while it's secure at night time it still activates the front elevation and there's plenty of old buildings in the backlands of all rural Irish towns. And this was derelict. And the guy came in, and he was a carpenter into the planning process. And he wanted to build a workshop. So we encouraged him to build a workshop on the ground floor as part of the refurbishment. Build two offices in the middle floor, so he's a rental income to pay for the mortgage for the refurbishment. And then on the top floor, he built a four-bedroomed apartment, which essentially became his house. And he can sit up there in his New York style loft apartment and look out the window. And I still visit him every six or seven months. And we go up and have a cup of tea and we look out over the town. But, you know, it was a good function for an old protected structure and you light it and living in the town centre. So we're arriving in, he can walk everywhere that he needs to for stuff like that. We also looked at uh, a lot of the old streets had very long back gardens and that are not used anymore. So we're looking at getting secondary terraces and back gardens. This is the local authority housing scheme. Here we put in the middle, a private sector scheme, and we designed them so they can all ultimately link together. So you'll get a secondary linear terrace of residential right in the town centre, parallel to the existing linear terrace of residential. So you're intensifying the amount of people that live in the town centre uh, in spaces that are available that we don't realise in the backlands. But it involves a lot of negotiation. Um, going back to Westport 2000, you know, this is the bigger picture. This is the academic look at it, where we looked at all the streetscapes that existed and the buildings in white, and the new build that could potentially happen, the brownfields brownfield sites to the rear. So that was it academically. And this slide shows how it happened in reality. 20 years ago, you could only walk along the main streets, and you couldn't get into all of these backlands. They were all blocked up. So every time a developer came in to look for planning permission, we insisted and he made a pedestrian routeway through their, new, uh, through their new planning application. So all those red lines are new pedestrian routeways. We gave them higher densities in the backlands, more residential on the upper floor, bringing people back to live in the town center and more commercial on the ground floor. So the commercial offer is greater. And so all these new red arrows are new pedestrian routeways going through the town center that didn't exist, giving lots more shops, lots more residential in the town center. The blue circles are where we acquired lands for the short term as car parking, and uh, which they're built now. And so we could ease the pressure on the main street so we could get rid of more car parking space on the main streets because it was compensated by putting parking in the backlands. 
and uh, ultimately they will probably be built on in the next 20 or 30 years with more sort of civic buildings and, and more development. So it's a never ending story. Um, the new streets we got on the backlands, we try to have them pedestrian only because if you don't have, uh, oops, sorry, if you don't have traffic on them, um, people spill out more onto the streetscape because it's not, it, 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 it's less adversarial and it's quieter and people are more likely to live on the upper floors. So you pass the surveillance of them looking down and more shops open on, on, on both sides. So, but at the same time, you provide car parking behind. So there is car parking and access with the car immediately adjacent. Um, a lot of my job as town architect in Westport was really talking to people and giving confidence to people in Westport that their local authority um, was uh, they trying to develop a relationship with, with their local authority. And this is a typical pavement, which is in poor condition. You know, 5% of my time is on the design board. 95% is out talking to people in the town centre and reassuring them that, you know, when we're replacing your pavement, we're going to use high quality material, natural limestone, decorative sets. And, you know, after two weeks, it's worth the pain that it will be positive afterwards. And there's the finished scheme. And once you do one or two small schemes with people, they get confidence in you as a local authority employee and, and you can go bigger and bigger next time. And you start getting a collective consciousness within the town for delivering positive projects. Uh, and on that particular scheme, every time we, we, we do something in the historic town core, we try and take out a few car parking spaces. So in this instance, we took out two spaces as part of this part, uh, uh, footpath rejuvenation. That allowed us to put in decorative light standards, underground the overhead wires, and the two spaces we took away, we have a wider pavement and a disability ramp. And we have a view of this lovely Georgian property, which because there might have been two all day. But each time you do a scheme, you try and get a little bit back in the town centre for people that was taken away by cars in the 50s onwards. And cars, you know, very hot topic always in the town centre. And this street in West Bridge Street, it's like, I suppose, our, our O'Connell Street or our Grafton Street. And back in 2004, we considered completely pedestrianising it because we felt, you know, looking at the main street, it was just full of cars on a wet day. It was a drab place and it wasn't attracting people to the town centre. So we decided that on a June bank holiday weekend, we'd trial it by closing the street down completely for four days. And this was the result. That's the exact same street as that, but I'm looking down a different direction. And as part of the consultation process, That if we put trees on the street. So we bought in these root balsamia matures, went down to the lower local sewage treatment plant, which was built at the, and we borrowed off the contractor. He lent us um, sewer pipes on forklift pallets, and the tidy towns painted them North Italian terracotta red. And at six in the morning, we had two pairs of forklifts dropping these trees in place all the way down the streetscape. So they're marching up the streetscape, these semi mature maple trees like sentinels or Roman soldiers. And it was a huge success. You know, the sun was there. It wasn't raining. It was a June bank holiday weekend. People were pouring onto the streetscape. There were skateboarders going up and down, spilling out for teas and coffee. So in the context of the street itself, it was fantastic. But in terms of the bigger picture, our issue was there were one and a half hour traffic jams and all the approach roads because we discovered we couldn't really completely pedestrianize until such time as the bypass we're still working on. The scheme ended up being a scheme. But just shows you there, if you look at the photograph of, um, you'd know it's the Celtic Tiger period, that lady's wearing a sleeveless fur coat. And uh, so times were good, 2000 or 2005. And people, instead of a car parking space, are out dining on the streetscape, not dissimilar to COVID issues today, and people coming out for wines and cheese. So it was a really positive thing. Uh, so we ended up having a compromise scheme by reducing the car parking, putting in trees, and making a large uh, pedestrian crossing in the centre, which acted like a square, because it was a long linear street without a square in it. And this is the result. You know, I'm standing at one side of the street, looking across to one of those pedestrian routeway arches on the far side, and the path material travels all the way across, surrounded by four big semi-mature trees. And when this photograph was taken, the tree was only installed about two or three months. Uh, we buy them in really big semi-mature, so they have an instant impact. And if you look at this illustration on the bottom right hand side, take away one car parking space, which is four and a half by five meters, sorry, two and a half by five meters. You get a tree in, you get artisans coming out selling jewelry. You know, families can pull in with babies um, so you get a lot of space. So, this, so th this public round space starts to become a great social 
and interaction value in the town centre. And it's delivering a lot more per square footage than the space underneath the car to the right hand side. So, you know, we really have a lot of public ground space, but you've got to consider what, what you have on it and how it can deliver and enhance your town. And then the bottom left hand side, take away five or six spaces. Um, and uh, you can take away five or six spaces on the bottom left hand side, you can get in seating, kids having their ice cream and bicycles. So it really starts enhancing your town center. And ironically, it makes your town more popular. So you get more people coming in, you have more cars as well. So it, 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 it's, 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 it's a funny thing. Um, I gave a talk in Athlone there last year, and I was, uh, this is down beside one's bar on the left bank. They took away about five or six car parking spaces here. It means that the bistro could bring tables and chairs outside. It became more popular, it became more viable for the landlord, for the rental. They started refurbishing the upper floors then as well. Oops. And uh, it became a really positive space outside these buildings, and much more positive than three or four par cars could contribute to. And if you take that same street and that alone walk up the street and take a right, you come into another space. Where in key areas, they took around 20 or 30 spaces out. And this is the Latin Quarter. This is the oldest bar in Ireland, Sean's Bar. Again, undergrounding the overhead wires, putting in trees, bicycle racks, outdoor. Beneficial for, for your town centre. Um, I attended a lecture there a few years back by an American guy, and he was talking about the car in the urban situation. And most car journeys in Ireland are, uh, is, is occupied, the car is occupied by single person, single driver, single occupancy journey, you know, and this could be any town in Ireland on, on Christmas Eve, you know, you think you're really busy because the place is packed with cars, it could be Westport on, on Christmas Eve and you think, you think it's really busy, but in reality, those cars aren't serving a lot of people because each car is a single person and that's the amount of people they're holding, which is not an awful lot considering the space it's taking up. So the people aren't terribly interesting in the shop, but it's all the land in between those people could be working a lot harder for the town and bringing more people in as opposed to holding, holding uh, metal boxes. And um, all those little things I've talked about in the last uh, 10 minutes or so, I've embodied in the changes that we've driven in the town's main civic space, the octagon, over three centuries. I have three slides here. So this is the octagon, the main civic space in the 19th century. It's very pedestrian friendly, there's no cars. It's almost social utopia. Everyone lives above the shop that they own down below. There's so many families in every street, they have their own football team, their own bonfire. And uh, you know, everyone knows each other, the social integration. And it's a very happy way of living. The merchant princes are there, that stability is there for 150 years. But we go from the 19th century and look at the octagon again in the 20th century, and this is the same space, just looking for a different angle. And let's see what's happened. Uh, you have the advent of rural electrification wires crisscrossing the streetscape. You have emigration, people going out to Australia and America, the new world, buildings being boarded up. You know, the change of a lot of architectural details in buildings from the proper period windows to casement windows. But the biggest social intrusion into any rural Irish town is the advent of the motor car. What was the theater and social space in the town for interacting pre-car becomes a sea of tarmac and your town centre is dominated by the motor car. So with all the initiatives we did from our plan that we put together, which you're putting together at the moment, we enacted things to try and reverse this over a 20 year period. And we went from this slot, this slide to this slide, about 20, 25 years later. These are the exact same spaces. That's the octagon from there to there. So what did we do? We undergrounded the overhead wires. We put in decorative lamp standards. We started planning trees to make the place more eco-friendly and more visually beautiful. We looked at color schemes on the buildings, which are very inexpensive to do and you get great visual gain. Bringing residential back into the town on the upper floors may not be suitable for families today, but for rental and short to medium term, that's really good. And most importantly, we judiciously discriminate against the motor car into narrow circulation routes where your big civic spaces are, muscling out and giving green spaces and planting back to people. But the irony is earlier on, when you do things like this, it makes your town even more popular and more cars come in. So you have to really look at parking in the backlands and be ready for, for that as well. But that allows you the flexibility to do things like that, going from that slide to this slide. Also, um, all the voluntary groups, there's so much intellectual capital in towns and different voluntary groups from the tidy towns to 
chambers of commerce, to business associations. And what we've done historically over the years is we've recognized all of those groups in town. And sometimes we want to deliver a particular project. We get a list of those groups on the left-hand side there. So the, you know, the, the local authority, the elected representatives, the councillors who are so important to the future of any town, the tidy towns, the hotelier groups. You pick one person from each of those groups and you make them into a new team and they drive a particular project. And this was the delivery of a new theatre delivered by a community group in Westport, but using the structure of the local authority. And it was the town hall the uh, on the octagon. It was a vacant building, the church donated, it was the old parochial hall. And um, the business leaders got together and applied for grant aid through the local authority and the building was refurbished. And it was a big success story. It's not run by the local authority, it's run by the community. And the, um, the community employment schemes are the ones who man the building. And this is it here on the left-hand side during the refurbishment. This is the same hall with a new interior in it. And um, when you're doing projects like this, it's important to get multipliers off them. When we're building the new extension at the back, we built Swift boxes into them because Swifts are in danger. And uh, we got extra points for the tidy towns for that. So there's always opportunities when you're doing a project to weave in other positivities in, into a town centre. Um, and again, what the theatre did is it brings lots of people into town, different performances. And these are various people that performed over the last few years. But they bring footfall into town. And one of the first things we did when we finished the building, we decided to have an inaugural event. So we decided to run the National Tidy Towns Conference there in 2017. Uh, brought Dermot Bannon down. And he was the MC for the day. And Dermot was brilliant. But we had Tidy Towns groups from all over the country. And... Um, Dermot gave each one of those tidy towns groups a brush to bring home. So I'm sure there was groups there from Port Arlington. And you've seen those brushes knocking around Port Arlington and various streets with the tidy towns. And the tidy towns are such a positive thing in any town in Ireland. It's a great national organization. And um, really, I know in Westport, the, when you put together all, all of the voluntary hours, there's over 5,000 voluntary hours a year put in to the town from tidying up from the tidy towns group because the local authority can't do all by themselves. So it's about cooperation. And that's uh, Dermot Bannon smiling and he took his own brush back with him to Dublin. Um, but of course in Port Arlington, you're no strangers to delivering really good civic projects like we did our town hall. Your leisure centre is, is a great exemplar on a, on a national level of how a community can come together and deliver just like we did with the town hall. And it's a real testament to you. Um, it's a beautiful building and uh, it, it gets lots of, it got national awards and lots of positive publicity and I've been to see it when I visited Port, so it's, it's a great facility. Another really important thing you have in Port Arlington is your proximity to Dublin. And I know the demographic in Port Arlington has nearly doubled uh, over the last 15 to 20 years because you get a lot of people coming that will commute to Dublin and settle in Port Arlington. And sometimes this can be ne looked on negatively as a dormitory town, but I think it's a fantastic thing because the greatest value a town can have is its human resources. And for you doubling your population, a very young demographic coming in and loads of young families attending schools. And so the railway station, I think, is a really positive thing for Port Arlington in terms of bringing uh, a, a new wave of people into town, but also increasing your intellectual capital. And you fresh people coming in and looking at the town with new eyes, which happens a lot with Westport, people coming in from, from outside, like, like myself having come, come from Dublin. And uh, so that human resources, and we're really hard for us in the West because so many people leave the West and go East. So we, we don't have that advantage you have. And I think it's a real strength for Port Art. Um, another thing we, we, we try to push in town, we try to make ourselves the Ireland's outdoor adventure capital, despite what they'll tell you in Killarney. And we'd started to put together lots of these Ironman triathlon type races. And we weren't that successful with them initially because we discovered Ironman came down, ran his race, ate his pasta and went to bed and he didn't spend any money. So we had to dumb down the whole race thing to sort of domestic man for a guy like myself who might do 5K of an evening. And domestic man will come down with his wife and his children and his family and they'll stay a weekend and they'll buy plenty of beer. And, and so, in other words, the income into the town is far better. And uh, they've been quite successful for us over the years, especially with the greenways. And of course, we don't have a blue way like you have. So don't underestimate outdoor recreation, uh, which is really important. There's domestic man up there 
on the right hand side checking his watch before he heads off for, for his race you know and brings people into town they love eating they love beer they love shopping and it's very good for small businesses um, the media the media particularly RT are always looking for heroes in rural Irish towns and uh, it's always important to develop a strong relationship with them. And if they want to come down and film, roll the red carpet out for them. They're just looking for material to use, particularly nationwide. So if you do any sort of initiative, it, um, and get them involved with you. And I know you've previously recently with Dirty Old Town, with Dermot Gavin, you know, and as they say, there's no such thing as bad publicity once they spell your name right, as the saying goes. So always roll out for the media. Mm. to get a second bite at the cherry in terms of publicity because you'd always build on any success you have by making it into a, a second success. So from the Irish Times we brought down Frank MacDonald and Aidan Dunn to judge a company in, in, in the paper and get more publicity and uh, we had a competition to design a piece of sculpture. It was one by Ronan Halpin, this artist, uh, oops sorry, at the uh, right now. Yeah, Ronan Halpin here, uh, an artist from Drogheda who lives in Ackle. Uh, when he won the competition, we did a little bit of Photoshop and we put the piece of sculpture in the photograph. It didn't look too well and we decided we had to redesign the whole corner. So I built an architectural model as the town architect uh, as a communications tool for people. And often um, people don't sometimes can't understand two-dimensional drawings. Doing models in terms of communication for public meetings can be very important as well. So we redesigned the whole corner and we put a little podium at the base of granite. And this is what it looked like beforehand. This is your... You know, uh, the engineers in the Department of Transport have realized in, in nations around the world that after 50 or 60 years, the more motorways you build and roads you build, the more traffic that comes out onto them. So the modern uh, traffic engineer is now looking at trying to reduce the amount of cars and trying to get people to get use transport in different ways, be it public transport or also using the bicycle or walking. So they're keen central government on sponsoring greenways to eliminate the amount of car journeys. And we got some funding in, in Westport a number of years back as a pilot town, and it's called Smarter Travel Money. And uh, we linked about 70% of the residential areas of Greenways. So kids didn't have to be brought to their friend's house in their parents' cars along a busy road. You could go on these independent Greenway network and go to your various friends' houses. So it made it very safe, and people started walking and cycling a lot more. And just the various uh, greenway links, linking 70% of the residential areas built in different phases. So just start small, build one, and keep on linking them together. And it really pays dividend down the road. And people, kids in the key school there, primary school, you know, their cycling take up was 1%. It went from that to 15% after we built the greenway system. So it really paid, paid good dividend for us. Um, we try to be a little innovative in terms of bike stands, just trying to make them, sculpt them like bikes. They're very popular for people taking selfies on and they travel around the internet. Um, also trying to build bike stands and we also have bike lockers in the town centre that you can rent very cheaply. So if you have an expensive bike that you feel safely if you get in town or you can hang your shopping in there while you're waiting to go back. So bike lockers are important as well. To try and encourage people to use the greenways when we built them, we had an initiative of a bike A different course in each hotel so you sign like a big mob of 150 people from hotel to hotel eating your course and they were really popular and it gets people's consciousness and buying into local authority infrastructure and um, one of the big public realm schemes we did uh, as part of that funding was down at the quay in Westport where the pavement is the old pavement here in the foreground on the right hand side was about four foot wide what we did is we took the old road, pushed it out into a green area across the way, and we made the footpath five meters wide. So we went from this type of footpath to this, and it changed the whole nature of the key area. So it wasn't just an extra offer, it became a destination in itself for the town. And uh, again, we built a lot of pedestrian crossings as well, with a lot of ramps to slow the traffic down. So if traffic is going by, they go at a really slow speed, so it makes it safer for pedestrians. 
And uh, that's one of those pedestrian crossings. If standing on the far side of the shop, you look directly out to the ocean and that view is blocked by cars in the past. And of course, you know, when you make your pavements five meters wide, this is the sort of stuff you can do and people start gathering. So it makes it really, really positive outdoor spaces. That's an aerial view of the finished scheme. Uh, that's the, we took five meters off the green, brought it across to the other side, pushed the road out, and then built a series of pedestrian crossings. And uh, it's like a big boulevard and people walk it on summer nights. And there's hundreds of chairs and tables, well not hundreds, maybe scores, of chairs and tables put out there in the summer. So it's a real popular outdoor eating area in the summer months. Greenways, which I know you're, you're, you're very keen on, and blueways in particular for yourself. Um, we, in Mayo, we probably built the first greenway in, in the country there uh, back in just before 2013. There's an old railway line, which we resurfaced linking Ackle to Westport. And uh, it was a huge success. We were very surprised when we finished it. It brought in 150,000 users annually. It meant 90 plus jobs to the local economy. And it brings in 7.2 million a year. Now those stats are a few years old, so they're probably greater than that at this stage. Um, but what we discovered is that um, towns like Newport, Mulrani and Ackle Sound, it completely rejuvenated them because with the green, we had a super highway of tourists coming in on their bicycles shopping and staying in cafes and staying overnight in hotels. So the collective power of the Greenway in linear rejuvenation, the linear economy and towns coming together collectively has been very successful. And you know, each town has its own story to tell. This is the Greenway coming through Mulrani, the home of the Irish goat. You know, you spin any story that a town has, you spin it as part of the narrative of that Greenway. And John Lennon stayed in Mulrani quite a bit when he bought his island. Uh, just off the bay in the hotel, just off the hotel, viewing out from the hotel. So it's the John Lennon story in Newport, you know, and all the local artists and producers like the cheese and the sausage makers along the Greenway, they come together as a collective and they're the gourmet Greenway people. So they have a collective marketing brand. So the power of these small individuals coming away, coming together through linear economic development of Greenways in various towns is very, very potent. And of course, you have a lot of the farmers' kids would have maybe had derelict structures on farms, old cottages, they've refurbished them into cafes. You know, and they're working in those now as opposed to going to Dublin or emigrating to London. So it's stemming to a certain extent the tide of, of people emigrating at a young age. It, it certainly makes a few stay at home, which is really important for us in the West. And then you come down to Newport, the ancestral home of Princess Grace of Monaco. You know, there's a story with every town. And uh, uh, there's a famous butcher in Newport, and he has a pudding there, the Greenway Gourmet Pudding. And he has his uh, red and white, red and green mayo sausages out on All-Ireland Day. And uh, he's ready for the Sam Maguire, but unfortunately he's had to put them in the freezer quite a number of times over the years. But hopefully someday he'll thaw them out and we'll cook them at an All-Ireland win. Um, also, in terms of driving the local economy, there's nine new bicycle shops along the Greenway. So that's a lot of employment, 20, 25, maybe 27 people. So the importance of greenways and blueways and interlinking and talking towns. And of course, when you have these greenways, when you're doing your urban regeneration schemes, it's important that the destination points of towns for greenways, they don't skim by the periphery, but they come into the center square where you have maybe your bike shop, your bike parking, your lockers, your cafes. So you bring them into town and getting that spent. Um, I was just looking at the brief for your Port Arlington 2030 urban regeneration strategy. It's so similar to ours in Westport for 2000. And I was looking at all the positive things in it in red there. You know, a vision for the public realm and the historic market square, the main street, the spa street, and the French church. You know, appropriate conservation of market house. You know, maybe what functions could they have? And then especially the creation of linkages from the market square to the main street, the adjoining amenities and the River Barrow, the People's Park, and the links between the town centre, and of course all the really good work that's been done out in the Derriance Bog, and the trails and lakes in the Barrow Blue Way. And then in terms of tra traffic management, which we've discussed extensively, for the potential for you know partial pedestrianisation in certain areas, or maybe taking away car parking spaces in the town centre, and the connectivity to the train station, which is really a lifeline, and it's, it's a tremendous potent thing for yourselves. And you know, development of walking and cycling infrastructure within the town centre and the provision for enterprise and economic development, 
and uh, also then area improvements on the built environment in terms of the hard and soft landscaping, you know, which are things that we, I, I, I really displayed earlier on in the talk. And of course, you know, linking your greenways out to places like Emo House and, and, and uh, you know, along the Barrow Way as well. You know, and the power of community groups in isolation, they're not terribly strong, but when they come together to a collective, like an event like this, and they've started gaining a collective consciousness, the potency of that is tremendous. And groups like the Lee Castle uh, Conservation Group and, you know, using the blue waves on the canoes there, there's, there's tremendous potential and linking in then with Emo as well. Um, you know, the, the, the value of those civic groups that put in the voluntary hours, the tidy towns, the business organizations, the voluntary organizations, your local church is so important. And really, and people don't really sometimes value the, the councillors and, and TDs, but they're tremendous people. They put their name on the ballot and they put their foot forward to represent people. And the councillors are really crucial on the TDs in a situation like this because they become the bridge between the community organizations like yourselves and also the executive and the local authority where the money lies. And if the councillors and TDs recognize there are good community groups here that are really positive and they're not talking about the past, they're looking at the future, they adopt those groups and they go in and the executive starts getting confidence in the groups. And you have this kind of three-way relationship that you, you, you have the groups, you have the executive and the councillors and TDs, really important bridge between those two. And, but the councillors need confidence in you as a group, so you must be positive and be looking forward. But that's already been expressed by the local authority having the um, intellectual greatness, really, to commission this plan and to get a 30-year lease on that garage and, and, and look that forward-looking vision that they have, so it's really important. You know, and I see small things that happened, you know, which have been very positive, the painting of the cinema and the new Odlum's clock in Port Arlington. And they, they, these things don't happen by chance. You know, they, they, they happen with hard work. Um, the final few slides here, Westport House, the equivalent to Emo, you know, Emo is really important for you in terms of bringing people to your locality um, and having events and venues. I remember years back, I attended the National Garden Exhibition there, which was fabulous. Uh, stayed with my friend Paul in Port Arlington. But there's Westport House, the Brown family, you know, uh, they had it for 250 years. It was only sold very recently. But there's Lord and Lady the Altamont up on the right hand side, you know, uh, cleaning up the estate in the 60s, ready for tourism. And this is at 50 years in business on the right hand side. Um, when we won the Irish Times competition, we had our big party down in Westport House. So it was great that they hosted. So it's important to have the big house for big civic events. Also concerts, we, we've run concerts in, in, in Westport House in the past, they've been quite successful. And again, bringing people down for the weekend. And uh, one of the more poignant little pieces of development we did, we did was um, a new set of gates into Westport House, because the house used to enter directly into the town and the council back in the bad old days in the 1950s, bought the front lawn of Westport House to build social housing. And it destroyed the relationship between the town and the house physically and I suppose psychologically. So after 50 years, uh, we negotiated with Westport House and built a new set of gates halfway up the lawn, right into the town centre. And uh, it was a sense of, I suppose, forgiveness for the past. And for the first time in 60 years, you had a direct link between the house and the, um, and the town. And they're known locally as the Gates of Atonement. And there's Lady Sheelan Brown outside the new gates, uh, who used to manage Westport House. She's there on the right-hand side at the Gates of Atonement. And... Despite being Anglo-Irish, she's actually a quintessential male woman because she's the 16th great-great-great-grandchild of Grace O'Malley, the Pirate Queen. And we don't know what Grace O'Malley looked like, but we found this girl on the internet and we think she looked a bit like her. But the only illustration we have of Grace is when she met Elizabeth I. Grace was raiding all the uh, boats, all the English boats for, for produce. She was very successful. Queen Elizabeth clamped down on her. Grace knew she'd have to negotiate with Elizabeth. So she sailed around to London, up to Greenwich Palace, where Elizabeth was, and she went in to negotiate a truce with her. And uh, Elizabeth couldn't speak any Gaelic, and Grace O'Malley couldn't speak any English, but they were both educated by the church. So they both spoke Latin, and they got on like a house on fire because they were women in a very male dominated world. And rumor has it for the rest of her life. So I suppose the moral of the story is it pays to cooperate with the government. <laughs> so, so partnership is just as relevant today as it was back in, in Grace O'Malley's time. And who better than uh, Lady Sheelan Brown, hand in hand, 
with uh, the town manager at the time, Martin Keating, to open the home and walk through the gates to a big party followed by a thousand of the townspeople up in West with this last slide is that you only it, it only happens if you come together as a collective. So a town must have a strong collective consciousness, develop coherently, like you're developing this evening on what you have already, and must set goals for the future like you will with your new plan that um, Leash County Council has envisaged and, and been very proactive in terms of bringing this to the table for you as the people of Port Arlington. Um, so I'd just like to say thank you. And uh, I'd like to say very much, like we were saying in 2020, is go Port Arlington 2030. Opportunities abound for a town team pulling together all the collective organizations. And if you'd like to get involved in Port Arlington 2030 in a very positive way, because positivity is the only way forward, if you could please email your details to action at the PBA Port Arlington Business Association at gmail.com. So I'd like to thank Port Arlington Business Association, the Tidy Towns, uh, the Port Arlington Community Development Association and the Dairy Ants and many, many more people for inviting me here this evening and uh, at Mark and Moelisa for the IT and I think having the buy run last night paid off for us. So without further ado, I'd like to say thank you and I'm just going to turn on the lights back on in my office. So I'll be back with you in 15 seconds for a Q&A. Thank you. Fantastic, Simon. Thank you so much. That was brilliant. I'll just let you get the lights on. Um, just to say, guys, there's a QA and a um, button on the Zoom there. So I know that, uh, I think, Laura, you've got a couple of questions in already. I don't know if anyone else wants to contribute. Um, I was going to say some, just thank you so much for giving your time and for sharing your, your, your knowledge. You know, it's fantastic. As you said, you mentioned a number of times, it really is a very positive story. And uh, I think you can see that there was a journey that you had to get to, you had to go through to get to where you are now. But it's fantastic to hear that it started with that Millennium Plan, you know. Um, and that's something that we can really kind of, we can hopefully kick off here with what's going on in Port Arlington at the moment. So there is a couple of questions. Is that okay if we, if we, um, if we put them out here? I'm, I'm here till midnight. Oh my God. All right, we'll see how we go. Okay, so I'm just going to click on the Q&A button there. So look, this is coming in from uh, Laura. And uh, Laura, I think, is, is with the PCDA. So the, the first, yeah, excellent. So I think the first question that Laura has there is, so like what was the, what change made the biggest difference? The, the commissioning um, a town design statement or an urban regeneration plan, that what made the biggest difference is exactly what you're doing in partnership with Leach County Council at the moment. Having investing in intellectual capital uh, uh, at the very beginning. So you had a structure and you knew when investment came, you had the ideas down on paper and it allowed you as a vehicle to apply for grant aid for various initiatives that come from central government and it also allowed the planners to see how the, how the and it also allowed the public buy-in to what that should be and uh, so you know, intellectual capital was the most crucial thing at the very beginning and that's exactly what you're doing as what we did at Westport 2000. It's amazing it's, it's such a parallel journey. That's fantastic so it's, that's a statement of intent. Oh, it's really yeah. good. And just said, uh, there's another one there just from Laura. So, um, okay, if you could do anything differently, what would you do? What would I do? Gosh. Um, I, I, gosh. Uh, yeah, I, I, um, gosh, that's a good question. I don't really know. I, I, I think, God, yeah, I've never, Laura, I've never been asked that one. I'm a bit stumped, which is unusual. <laughs> um, I would probably... Um, Yeah, I, I would probably have got into interaction with uh, the townspeople at an earlier stage in Westport. Um, I probably, after the development plan, um, I probably would have got involved in the ground at a little earlier in terms of the, the, when, when I came online. I was only working a day a week for Westport at the time or two days a week. And after a while, I went five days. But if that had happened at an earlier stage, we probably could have accelerated the process a little bit more. It is unusual for local governments uh, to have architects. We're unusual in Mayo County Council. We have quite a large architects department, which does help uh, when you have that uh, resource in terms of plans like this. Um, yeah, that, that, that's all I can say, Laura. But, you know, on the journey, you will get bruised and you'll, you, you, you will get scrapes. And 
no matter what people tell you in advance, it's not going to change, but that's part of the learning process. And if you don't get a few bruises along the way, you're not learning. So uh, yeah. it's one of the reasons of no hair left. <laughs> that's it. It's part of the journey. That's it. Yeah. You know, not a great answer, but it's the best I can do at the moment. No, no, that's really good on the spot, you know, and then just again. So, yeah. So what was, what did you find was the biggest challenge? The biggest challenge was, um, getting uh, getting people the, the, the most of work was getting people to buy in initially and we did that by getting the groups to start with really small projects like maybe a painting scheme or a fountain or something small so it gives because people often are afraid to put up their hand in a voluntary capacity and get involved in these things because they're not sure how successful they're going to be but if you start with something very small with a group and you demonstrate that they can do it and they have the confidence to come and do the next big thing and the next and it grows and grows one thing i did find and really good was entering competitions like the Tidy Towns competition, our pride of place. There's nothing like a competition that brings townspeople together really quickly because they're there sweeping out the house and getting the, 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 the front hall ready for the judges coming in. So if the town was a house, they're cleaning it up and they're getting it ready and they're putting the best foot forward. And you get that social integration between all the various groups that are working in isolation so that's really crucial enter competitions it's a real good accelerant in terms of the community getting a collective consciousness for positivity very good no, thanks Simon. i think that kind of thinks and so uh, caroline has just put in a question there which is around did you find it difficult to get buy-in and i suppose that kind of links in you're sort of suggesting there to to start you know build start. it over build it up but you know like even having an evening like this where there's groups of representatives are playing this afterwards it's a way of pulling people together like this evening is a communication thing and it starts pulling people together in various groups that are working in isolation and it gives them a collective consciousness as a bigger group and uh, that helps with buy-in but entering competitions and doing small projects delivering them and it gives the group confidence and it also gives people who want to give voluntary hours into the town and they're afraid to when they see something positive and it's been successful they've no problem joining there's so many people on the cusp of willing to give their time and energy yeah and in particularly retired people who may uh, who may, might be very have expertise in certain areas and they're looking for projects post-retirement for the community and the common good i find that a tremendous resource in Port Arlington, you have so many young families that have come in and looking at it with fresh eyes. That's an extra resource that you have, which is fantastic. Now that's really good, Simon. Just, I, I just uh, another question there from Laura was around, like, how hard was it to get a common vision for the town? I suppose that's part. So there is a collaboration process that's coming with the, the consultants that are coming in. So I suppose this is kind of the formulation bit there. So was that difficult in Westport to get that common vision to build the Millennium Plan? Um, you know, it ended. We ended up having a lot of meetings in the town hall and trying to get consensus between people. Sometimes a misinterpretation that the public have is that uh, the local authorities like Santa Claus, they can deliver everything, <laughs> so, which is not true. You know, they're very good, but there's limited resources. So it's a, ma it's a matter of really making a shopping list of what you think is good collectively for the town and then prioritizing those and then picking the ones that are most suited to potential grant aid and delivering those. Yeah. So uh, it, it's, it's all about meetings like this and getting the groups together so you have a town team so there's a coherent and there's a representative committee of that so you have a coherent liaison through the councillors and the tds who are your bridge into the uh, into the local authority where, where, where the funding is and where the applications are bedded down for more funding from central government if the local authority have a really good active town team in port arlington it gives them confidence to invest time in them and, and, and projects then that can be delivered that are identified in that plan that's great, Simon. Thanks. So just a question there from Elisa. And I suppose like one of the things that, that Port Arlington would be, you know, really strong on is, is the, the heritage, you know, with the French Huguenots. Um, you know, so th there's a kind of a double double question in there. Like, so how would you leverage it? And then also like, uh, you know, did you consider a heritage centre in Westport or did you kind of feel that you were already served with a Port House? Um, we, we, we have a heritage centre uh, which needs a new home at the, at the moment. Heritage is a great leverage in terms of getting grant aid, you know, and to discuss these issues with your conservation officer or your heritage officer within Leash County Council, you know, they would be very conscious of the town's heritage, but there's lots of initiatives for refurbishment of uh, our, our works to heritage and protected structure buildings that um, are available because they have that status. So it's, it's, it's actually can be a very positive thing 
in terms of, of getting grant aid if your building is protected. Uh, and of course, you know, your, your classic example is if it's a really important civic building like Ryan's Garage in the town centre and the fact the local authority have a lease on that uh, for a certain period of time, it makes it investable for grant aid people uh, within the various departments in Dublin. And, uh, you know, but, but the, 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 I suppose the legacy that the Georgians uh, have given you uh, with the town squares and the town centres is that they have so much potential because they're period structures, period public bound spaces. And, you know, they they press all the right buttons for grant aid, particularly if you're going to make them into really positive public bound spaces for people usage, uh, you know, as opposed to car parking. Uh, which is really what, what you need to do selectively now, not in a blanket manner, but selectively. It's very good, Simon. Yes. Yeah. So there's kind of the, there's a balance to be struck between leveraging that their heritage, but then obviously you want to boost the, the you know the, the commercial part that comes oh, yeah. with that as well. They kind of go hand in hand. But they do go hand in hand. Absolutely. Very good. So just a question there from uh, from Aidan. So I suppose another unique um you know particular report is that that we share to uh, county councils. So this is kind of this this is coming from the. Well, there's a huge part of the town that, that, that lives and, and a big population that are on the Offaly side. Okay, you know, Aidan is trying to, to, to see how would you look at different uh, local authorities? Um, well, I suppose you can look at it very positively. You two grand sources. <laughs> um, yeah. That, 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 you know, that everything has a positive, positive element about it. I, that, that, that should be brought up, but I assume that the historic core of Portington predominantly is in Leash, and it's the new town that has crossed the river. Would, would that be is my assumption correct there, or is the historic town straddling both sides? It actually, I think it goes up to St. Patrick Street, which could be on the, it's over the, 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 the bridge, and I think that will be, but it's, it might even be included in the remit. You know, I'm not sure. I want an opportunity to find out And for, uh, you know, where if you do a master plan for a town centre, an urban regeneration plan, which you're doing, it can be used as leverage for the submission to identify one or two projects that you could get uh, significant funding for. So in this plan, there's also a grant age leverage for you as well. But perhaps joint application between the two local authorities. I'm not as familiar with the demographic yourselves or the layout of the town, but... Um, it could be an opportunity, potentially. Very good. Thanks, Simon. I think that ties in. So, Anne Turdy, just uh, I put in again, just around the fact that we have two local authorities and could it be a bonus or an but I think you're kind of saying there that, like, potentially it could actually be a bonus if you can kind of leverage the both sides. I would only look at it as a bonus because you benefit from it. It's the only way to look at it. Very good. Um, so just a question there from Melissa, and it's just around the, the ecological uh, heritage. So I suppose that that's another thing that like, you know, uh, Port is on the border. If you look at Google Maps, you'll see a big brown bio there like that, which is all, all the peatlands, you know, and then you've got the, the barrow and the dairy ounce. So the ecological uh, heritage, like how could we, you know, how could we uh, make the most of that? I, I think there's great thing for ecological heritage at the moment, particularly with climate change. We're no longer involved in fossil fuel. The great uh, in terms of the last era, um, which is probably prevalent in your area. So there, there's there's lots of funding for, uh, converting old peat bogs in, in, into uh, ecological centres. I think they would be a, a bonus destination along your greenway or your blue. Uh, I, I think um, that's something you should definitely weave into your plan for sure. Like, don't look at the town in isolation. You must look at the broad picture. And when you do that with your plan, it gives people who are assessing those plans the confidence to invest in you because they're looking at the more sophisticated applications that are looking at the big picture. And then you go down into the specific projects like maybe the town square or the Ryan building or like that. So the broad picture is important because you're looking at all the different palettes of attraction. So not only looking at the built environment, but you're also looking at the natural environment as well. So, you know, most places don't have that. And, and, and you know, you have an abundance right on the airport. Yeah. And what do you think then? So, as a focus in the, around the, the kind of the, the but, but uh, 
drawing reference to these other advantages that we have as part of that depot limit. Any grant aid applications coming in, they look at the broader picture like that, even though you may not be applying for funding for that particular bog, but the fact you have an idea that, and you're looking at the broader picture gives them confidence in terms of uh, what, what you're targeting in terms of money. Okay, that's that's really good advice. Um, so another question, so um, as I said, if you go down Patrick Street and beyond the French Church there, or trade the town, there's a lot of snow and uh, buildings and uh, they've been converted into multi-family units and you know in, in some cases they wouldn't be very well managed like um, did you have that and you know how did you approach managing that yeah well that's a good problem to live in the town center so the fact that they're 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 living there is a really positive thing because they're living above the shop and they're living in the streetscape. So at night time, you have passive surveillance that the streets are being observed because people live on the upper floors. You know, um, if, if some of them maybe haven't been converted that sensitively, you know, it's really important if you're looking to redevelop a town that maybe not to look at the past so much. You've got to look at the opportunities in the future. And maybe there could be better ways of, of, of doing that. You know, I have regrets myself and some decisions I've made here in, in, in the West over the years, but you can you, you can only look forward. But having people in the town centre living in buildings it is actually a very positive thing. It's very good. So yeah. you're, it, it, it's actually a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. And, and something like that, like if you were if you were looking to, um, you know, to, to put in guidelines for, for how those those type of houses were dealt with, would that be coming? So where would that be coming from? Is that part of this plan or do you have, you know, is it, is it would it be council offices then or wh where would you see the sort of um, the, the, the control or the, the regulation of that coming from? Um, well, I, I, the, the, the regulation would, would come through the local local authority obviously but the ideas the local authority are looking for the ideas from yourselves so in terms of what you want more residential at the town center maybe new civic offices potentially if you know if, if the demographic is right for it and um, you have a great library building maybe you might like a new theater start making a list of things that you might want in the town center and then you know decide yeah I, as i said the local authority not like santa Claus, can provide everything but maybe prioritize of what's best for the town and put it in your plan and then you can apply for the grant aid individually for those projects but when you're submitting for the grant aid you have the greater overall plan but in terms of uh, policing that planning process that is the job of, of, of the local authority and that's what it should be as well yeah no, very good okay that's cool so we have a question coming in there and this is from uh, the man that they got going paul hulan um and it's it's not a heckle it's it's a legitimate question which is good um so he's just saying there's so what is the best way to get landowners to provide access for greenway for greenways a talk and negotiation uh, first of all i'd like to say hi to paul paul and i were in secondary school together and he's my best friend in life he was my best man in my wedding great <laughs> <laughs> but um negotiation it, it's all about um, calling at people's doors, explaining the greater good to them. If you look at the Great Western Green, which goes from Westboro Ackle, um, all of that was done through permissive access by sitting down with the landowners. It took a year or two of negotiation. There was a team of two specifically given to, to that task, and they negotiated for almost a two year period with all of the landowners. None of it was done through compulsory purchase order by explaining to them that it would ban county. Uh, so it's, it's and, and the Greenway is not a right of way today. It goes through private land and it's closed down officially one day a year so it can't establish itself as a right of way. So um, just resources, but that's the way we did it. And it was quite successful. Now, unless CIE still own a section of an old railway line, they own it in its entirety, you can buy it off them. But I think there was 56 owners on, on, on the um, the Ackle Greenway, and uh, they were all negotiated with. They still own those lands. Spending time with people and giving them confidence in you as an organisation. That's a remarkable achievement to get uh, all the guys. So. But you know, the Mayo, the, 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 the Ackle Greenway was the first in the country, but they're building them all over the nation. And the more they build them, the better. So the whole whole network of cycling routeways. So hopefully maybe in 10 or 15 years time, 
when I come to Port Arlington on, on, on a holiday to see Paul again. I, 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 I can cling there. Going through all the counties on the way down, the more greenways we build, the better it is for Ireland Inc. You know, and you must remember, don't think of yourself as a county. You're a player as part of the Team Ireland. And that's really important. And you've got to be the best player you can be for Ireland. So working within a county, you don't think of yourself national stage i think i think that's a fantastic way so just i know you said you stay till midnight i think we'll be we'll be we'll be reasonable and maybe let you go a little bit earlier okay. but it's a fantastic way and a really positive message again to maybe to wrap up and i just want to reiterate uh thank you so much as i said i think you're, you're creating a legacy here by even having this talk and the fact you know we, we've reached out to these people uh it's going to be recorded and shared so it does i you know we really appreciate your time and your your, your knowledge and finally i, I just like to thank you to yourselves and also thanks from everyone to to leash county council for having the vision to commission and put this plan together it's it's a tremendous thing to invest in intellectual capital and the leverage that that creates in the future can be phenomenal that, that's great Simon. coming up we're just going to wrap up I, we just got one more question came to you just at the very end do you mind if we just if we just ask this from caroline and caroline does a lot of work with the, the the tidy down so it's just on the derelict buildings and do you have any issues with that in uh in westport links in the west um what we did do as a local authority uh, is that we um try and and negotiate with the owners to potentially buy them and convert them into housing schemes and uh, we've successfully done that with a number of them in the past some of the more problematic buildings that are derelict often because there's a problem with title and sometimes what we've done is we've given the tidy towns money to buy paint and they would paint those buildings it's only a solution for a year or two but it does help uh, in terms of defying a situation immediately particularly if you're entered into a petition and um Often what has happened with derelict buildings is because they've been inherited verbally as opposed to through probate, there's no proper title. And when a local authority CPOs a puts a compulsory purchase on a building in a non-adversarial way, they create a new freehold title and they can sell it back in for a pepper to, to those who, who to invest in the building uh, because often they're not invested in because the title is incorrect because it's been inherited verbally, it's been multi-generationally, particularly in the west of Ireland. Uh, so there's different ways of tackling them. But um, for the towns to do some work in those buildings. That's a really comprehensive uh, answer. And I'd say that could be applicable to some of the, the derelict buildings in the town here, you know. Um, so look, uh, yet again, thank you very much. And Simon, look, we look forward to seeing you down with us. I see yeah, you might get a chance to cycle down, but we'll we'll absolutely we'll see us as, as part of the bigger player, you know, for the for Team Ireland, and we'll we'll, we'll do our best to, to to take things on from here. Or to going for a cappuccino in the main square with uh, yourself, Mark, my Lisa, and Paul. That's a date. Sounds fantastic. All right, look, very good. Thank you so much to everyone for the call as well too. I think it was great to see that so many people, like as you said, you were worried about the with the town hall. You get to lock the doors. You need to. You manage to maintain all all the all the participants the whole way through it there because it's a really engaging uh, presentation and uh, that's it was it was wonderful. So look, we'll talk to you again soon anyway. All right. So thank you very much to everyone. I'm just going to close it off there now. Port Arlington. Good night, Portland. Good night, Westport.